Hey there, what are we talking about today? Respiratory protection. To bring some experience to the conversation, I am joined today by Evan Harden, uh, who at one point told me that he was willing to nerd out on all the things we've learned the past year with different face covering options. That's a direct quote. This guy knows what he's doing. Uh, so Evan, as a QSSP with over a decade of experience, uh, you've seen all sorts of changes in respiratory protection over the years. But I have to imagine that this past year was the top for changes in the area of masks. Yeah, absolutely. I don't necessarily know from a from a changes standpoint. You know, we had obviously some speed bumps along the way with product availability and people, um, you know, trying to make lemonade out there when when respiratory products um, were were very difficult to get over the past you know 12 to 15 months of the pandemic. But um, other than a few maybe. Uh, regulatory, just uh, short-term, you know, emergency uh, authorization use or uh, emergency use authorization EUA. Um, you know, for the most part, the standards haven't changed. I think that's maybe a misconception that a lot of people had last year was that that they didn't have to fit test people and they could, you know, get away with using respirators without actually having a respiratory program, regardless of whether it's for an actual um, you know, physical hazard, whether it be, you know, mist or dust or chemicals or whatever it is, no different than a virus. And I think that the big thing, and that was a huge misconception, and um, it's just something that hopefully we don't have to ever have to realize again, but I think we've certainly learned learned a lot from uh, from the pandemic. I know today's call isn't about the pandemic, Kurt, so I don't want to go down that path too much, but uh, absolutely, respiratory protection has been front and center the past 12 to 15 months, and, and I think we'll continue to be um, really moving forward with that increased sense of, um, I don't know, just awareness around uh, around health in the workplace. It seems like it's everywhere now. Everybody's thinking about masks in a way that we just haven't done as a society before. So does anything stand out to you as the most important thing when it comes to respiratory protection? Well, to me, I think it's just getting back to the basics. Like I said, I think a lot of people in, in 2020 and, and even here in 2021, you know, we're shooting this video here in, in early June 21. I, I think a lot of people are still kind of putting a Band-Aid on an artery, if you will, and, and they're still trying to find, and I think most people have have got to that quote unquote new normal. I, I hate using that word because we use it so much. Um, but at the end of the day, I, th I think that that, that folks need to get back to the basics. And, and when I talk about back to the basics, and, and I, I think we'll get into it here in a few minutes, it's, I mean, it, it really is the basics. It's about understanding the hazard. You know, can we can we remove that hazard? Um, if we can't, can we replace the hazard, right? Can we substitute it? Can we, can we keep people away from the hazard, right? So uh, isolating people. And again, when we think hazard, we're not thinking about viruses. We're not thinking about pandemics. We're thinking about the, the traditional uh, reasons, at least that's what I'm talking about, as to where where and why someone uh, someone wears any type of PPE, respiratory obviously being a, a pretty critical one that that without can obviously cause uh, cause significant injury or, or potentially death. So if we go through all the you know all the, the the kind of the hierarchy of safety and and finally get down to the fact that we know we now need PPE, we know we need a respiratory product. Um, you know, again, that's what I guess I'm talking about when I say get back to the basics. And, you know, an employer has to have that written respiratory program. They have to uh, make sure they're doing the, the fit testing uh, annually, as well as if any of the, the products or conditions change. Um, they have to have their medical evaluations actually done before they uh, before they do the, the fit testing. So the basics is, is again, I think what uh, what we were all trained on, what, what folks who, who are probably listening to this today have uh, have used in years past, but that's kind of gone by the wayside the past 12 to 15 months. And I think the the, the conversations that we're having out there with people today are, are truly about one you know respiratory protection programs, you know, or, or 101 if you want to call it 1910 134. Um, that's the OSHA standard. Um, you know, uh, NIOSH has specific standards. CSA for our Canadian neighbors have standards. Uh, um, M. Shaw from the mining side has a respiratory standard, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about getting back to the basics. Okay, so I like the idea of getting back to the basics. Um, and before we uh, nerd out on any specifics, let's take a high level look at a few things here. What jobs or industries need to be thinking about respirators? And I'll ask my follow up before I even let you talk. Uh, what 
types of respiratory protection might make sense for those roles? Yeah, I mean, it's anything and everything. I mean, I so I more so look at the hazards before you get into the roles. Um, I think that when you understand the the contaminants that are that are uh, present in the workplace, whether that's you know within the four walls of a building, or whether that's again, you know, you could be a, on a construction job site and you know have silica dust. You know, it's still something I'm driving down the road every day. And, and although there were significant changes to um, to silica dust standards uh, a couple of years ago. We still see people out cutting cutting concrete dry with no respiratory products on, and, and that's a known carcinogen, right? That's something that will kill you, and and yet you still see it out there. But I think you know, really, again, looking at the, the different types of hazards. So, is it a dust? You know, in the example of of a, of a silica dust, um, is it a fume? Is it a mist? Is it a gas? Is it a is it a vapor? Um, if you're a firefighter, is it smoke? Uh, maybe it's just oxygen deficiency. Right. So you know, you're going into a confined space. Um, there's no oxygen to breathe there. Um, so all of those hazards would be examples of where you obviously need a respiratory protection program. And again, I know you said you, before we nerd out, so I'll try not to go too deep into it. But <laughs> but each of those categories or each of those hazards, I should say, you know, there's there's a process to identify because, you know, certain levels of dust could be acceptable. Um, more higher concentration, obviously, you know, it could mean a, uh, an N95, could mean a half face, could mean a full face, it could be a, a you know, a full supplied air system. And, and the gamut of the concentration and the time an employee spends in that environment is really what's going to dictate, again, the, the, the type, the frequency, um, the training, Everything, evol everything involved with respiratory protection program. And I think I should probably preface my next question here with the idea that I think this is a simple question, but it's probably closer to a short question that has a long answer. Why should we care about fit tests? Well, fit tests, I mean, it's it's exactly that. I mean, it's it's making sure that the the respirator actually fits someone's face. You know, I see today you've got some stubbles going, you got a little beard going there. I, I still have my COVID my COVID beard, I call it, um, here in the <laughs> office today. So neither you or I would even be able to to take a fit test because we haven't you know met all the requirements first. Uh, one of the first requirements is being clean shaven, right? So that's why you see so many firefighters out there with mustaches right? Mustaches only or mustache in your, your goatee because they have to be able to get a tight seal on right. that on that respirator, whatever it is. If it's a half face, you know, it's around your cheeks. If it's a full face, it's up, you know, above your forehead and, you know, around your jawline, uh, uh, wrapping underneath your chin. And again, in all places where um, where that respirator is going to hit, whether it's a, a even an N95, right, or, or, or particulate, you know, probably doesn't have quite as much coverage as a half face, but you still have to be able to get a tight seal. If, if you don't get a tight seal, then, you know, I'm not going to sit here. And this is one of the things from the pandemic, right? You you can uh, you can use a balaclava or a, a net gator. You know, if people pull that up over their nose or over their mouth, I think most respiratory people who are who know respiratory know that, yes, that's better than nothing. Right. And I won't go down my my rabbit hole on it. Uh, however, when you're not creating that tight seal, you know, there's still exposure. There's exposure for the, the wearer as well as the people around them, which, again, I think is what the main concern is with, with the pandemic. So at the end of the day, you know, to answer your question in short, uh, I mean, fit testing is everything. Um, if you're in an environment with zero oxygen or with a, a, some sort of vapor or, or, you know, IDLH type of chemical, that one little, little breath you're down, you're out. Trust me when I say that that fit test is important, right? Maybe it's not as important when you're just dealing with some dust that you're sweeping in a grain bin, right? Um, again, and you could argue that it is absolutely a prolonged exposure, just as dangerous, but, um, you know, versus a chemical plant or, a, uh, a, again, a, a confined space with no oxygen, where, again, you have no oxygen, that's a pretty bad deal <laughs> if, 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 you don't have a, if you don't have a tight fit there. Um, and so, yeah, fit testing is everything. It's, it's the only way to determine if a mask fits properly and is working and creating that adequate seal and, and really protecting the person from whatever it is that they're trying to protect themselves against. 
you probably get this uh, when you have to talk with people like me who are dangerous with Google, but I read that there are two types of fit tests, qualitative and quantitative. Am I right? Can I trust my Googling? Your Googling is right. Yeah, a qualitative <laughs> versus a quantitative. And I, I think it's, and again, you can really, really nerd out on this. I know that, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, if there's a industrial hygienist is watching this today, uh, forgive me. And uh, we would love to get further in the weeds with you. Um, and again, an industrial hygienist, who they, this is their job, right, to, to worry about industrial hygiene. But, you know, at, at the core, uh, the way I look at a qualitative is, um, and it's all about really assigned protection factors or what they call an APF. And there's about 20 or maybe 10 acronyms when it comes to, you know, respiratory protection programs. But um, really, it's about APF and, and the APF level that you need to be able to get, again, the assigned protection factor. Um, and depending on what type of respiratory product you're wearing, um, you have to get a minimum level. And so if you're wearing something like a, uh, a particulate, an N95, um, you, usually, you can do a quantitative fit test. Um, they don't usually yield really good results with an N95 or a, you know, a, um, a P100 or anything like that. But you know, traditionally, you'll see an N95 in a qualitative environment. Maybe, maybe a, a half face. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, anytime you get into the half face, the full face um, types of types of settings, then then you absolutely want to go to the quantitative um, where you're actually, you know, counting the particulates and and, and, and measuring the fit factors. And um, again, it's a very technical, uh, you know, standard driven test, right? There are certain activities you have to do um, while you're doing it. You have to be able to move your head and you do that in a qualitative as well. But the difference is, you know, you're in a qualitative, you're looking or, or I should say looking for a taste or a smell. And you, it's kind of like a self-police, which I've seen people, I've done it myself just because I wanted to see if I could. I don't recommend it. Um, uh, taking off your mask when you, you got Vitrix in your, in your hood there, uh, you'll, you'll taste that on your lips and on your teeth for, for days. <laughs> but, uh, so if you try to cheat the system, you, you, you can. Um, but, uh, but in a quantitative environment, you can't. And it's really black and white. And that's again why you use a quantitative fit test for those, uh, those, those, you know, hazards that are truly IDLH, and if it's not done correctly or formally documented or really both, um, it could really hurt someone or, or even worse. And so, um, and not to mention the fact that you're not in compliance with the law or with the regulation, which again, if something was to happen and, and there was a post-accident investigation um, or some sort of litigation that was going on and you weren't able to prove that you did your part as the employer, and, and by proving you did your part, it's the, the, the raw data around a quantitative fit test, you know, you could, you could get yourself in some hot water there. So um, definitely important to understand the difference and the different products that, that you, you know, you want to use for a qualitative versus a quantitative. And again, if you're not sure, just, uh, just give us a shout and obviously we, we can help you down that path. I'm guessing that there are a few times that we have to do this uh, type of testing. I would assume that it's the first time I'm coming onto a job site. I've just been hired. I'm just coming over to this location, maybe. That's one that stands out to me that would be obvious. But are there other times that we need to be thinking about this? Yeah, that's the obvious, the most one. Just a new employee. Um, a new employee starts and you know he or she is going to be required to, to wear a respiratory product for, for whatever their job function is. Um, they have to, first and foremost, have the medical clearance. So um, again, you're restricting breathing, you're restricting airflow. If you've got underlying health conditions, um, that can cause a lot of other trickle down issues there. Um, when, when you start, again, raising the blood pressure, raising your heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, I think the, the, maybe the most common thing is you change a product and I won't call out brands, but you know, you go from brand A to brand B and, and they're both half face respirators with, uh, you know, an organic vapor cartridge on it. And they, they, for the most part, look the same. Maybe they got a different logo on them. Maybe they're a slightly different color, but you're going from a half to a half. You have to refit test there because, again, the fit test is, is based upon the make and the model and maybe even the size, right? Maybe the sizing. Maybe brand A, I wear a medium. 
of brand B, I wear large. You don't know that until you actually do the fit test. I mean, you do, you can put it on, you can probably feel it, but the average person who isn't a respiratory protection expert or isn't a PPE expert, he or she doesn't know. And they rely on their employer and the person who administers the, the program to, to lead, you know, to lead them in the right direction. So again, new hire, um, uh, any change in the product. And really the, probably the third biggest one is, is, is change in, in job function. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, but, you know, say you're going from, uh, you know, from a, a you know, a custodial role where you're you're cleaning and you're sweeping dust and maybe you're you know you're doing one thing to the next day or the next week, you're literally on the production floor and you're handling chemicals and you're you know, you, you want to refit test on that. Um, and again, I don't necessarily know if that's a if that's a standard or if that's a great example I should say, but um, anytime that the situation changes um, or the job function changes or again maybe you're wearing it for two hours a today but tomorrow you have to wear it for six hours and that's going to be the new normal. I got to wear a full face respirator for, for six hours a day. Again, you want to make sure that, and I, and I wouldn't recommend that. I, when we start talking about wearing, you know, respiratory protection, you know, four, six, eight hours a day, every day, a week. And that's when we start talking in the, you know, PAPR systems, uh, uh, SCBA systems, depending on the severity, uh, supplied air systems, which, you know, you technically you'd still be, uh, you know, wearing a, a, a whole a full face, um, unless it was a, again, a supplied air with, with a paper hood. And again, we can, we can nerd out right if we want, Kurt. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, again, what do we say? New employee, uh, um, uh, change in product, change in hazard or, or use in, in the environment that's being used in. Uh, Evan, this has easily been the best conversation of my day. Thank you for your time. All right, it's still early in the day, so uh, don't don't count your chickens. <laughs> Thanks again, Evan. All right, Kurt. Thanks, man.